So we have these scatter plots, and uh, what we want to model to understand the relationship between x and y is a function called regression function. So regression function f is the ideal predictor for finding the relationship between x and y. And we never have access to this ideal predictor. So this is the predictor um, that predicts the data generation process. So what is the data generation process? So in statistics and machine learning, we always think of this elusive concept, data generation process, which is how the data has been generated, how these values of x and y um, you know, have been produced. And they come from a process with some noise. So uh, we usually think of you know, a data generation process um, to be you know, a function of, of x, uh, something like this line. And this data generation process is noisy. That's why these points that we have are not exactly on this line, but there are some, some differences. So these differences that you can see with the vertical lines, these are irreducible errors. So that's what we represent by epsilon. So these are irreducible error, meaning that regardless of how good our predictor is, we cannot reduce this error to zero. So the very best predictor that we can have for kind of mimicking this data generation process is being able to capture this line, but even in this curve. But even this curve doesn't meet all these points. So that's why in, in machine learning and statistical learning and statistical inference, we always have some irreducible error. So now we can have um, you know, an estimated model, something like f prime of x, um, which is the model that we fit to some training data or some historical data to um, estimate the parameters of, of some curve like this, right? So this estimated model can be as simple as a line. That's what we call linear regression. So let's say that I'm using this line. So this is f prime, this is f. So I'm using this line to summarize the relationship between x and y. So as you can see, there's also some, um, some differences between these data points and their, their image on the line. So these are the differences. So these differences represent the, um, the MSE, or mean squared error, of our predictor f prime. So, so the same way that this data generation process has some error epsilon, our estimated model has some error called MSE. And uh, you know, the very best thing that we can do in terms of estimating a model is estimating such a good model that MSE becomes equal to epsilon. So usually in statistical learning, we think of this epsilon not being zero. So we always think of data coming from some noisy process, or um, at least coming from signals uh, where we have some measurement error, at least. Uh, that's why the error cannot be, cannot be zero. All right, so this is um, F prime, and it has some, some MSE value. So let's say this is MSE of F prime. And we can measure it by looking at these differences. So we're going to see the, we're going to see the exact formula a bit later. Um, but yeah, pretty much the average of the squares of these distances gives us MSE. So here we have, um, we have eight points, right? So MSE is simply the average of this value to the power of two plus this value to the power of two, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. That's MSE of F prime. So, so you may remember the concept of um, underfit and overfit. So now I have a question for you. So do you think F prime is underfit or is a good fit or is overfit? Anyone? Raise your hand if you want to answer. Under it's underfit. Why is it underfit? Yeah. Exactly. So this line doesn't really capture the nuances and patterns that we have in this curve. So with the curve, you can see that here, it goes up and it goes up sharply, then it, the, it slows down, then it kind of declines, and then up again. But the line that we have is, is just too simple to represent the you know, characteristics of the data generation process. That's why F prime is underfit. And we're going to see later how we can actually measure and quantify you know, the fits of a model. We're going to see, you know, we're going to measure some value, and based on that value, um, make, it, you know, make some inference about how good that's, that estimated model is for the data that we have. So F prime is underfit, just you know, visually looking at you know, what's happening here. Uh, so let me now um, try another, another model. So what if I somehow uh, fits a model that uh, looks like this.
So this one. Do you think it's a good fit or underfit or overfit? Anyone? Uh, yeah, but here we have the data generation process. So in terms of uh, you know, its closeness to the data generation process, is it, is it close or not? It's really cl close. That's why f prime, sorry, f zegon is a, is a good fit. Um, and when it is a good fit, it means that if we calculate some MSE for f zegon, it's going to be quite close to epsilon. For this one, uh, the MSE um, is not close to epsilon. Actually, depending on whether we use the training data or test data, MSE of f prime can be much larger than epsilon or much smaller than epsilon. Um, so it, it, it may come you know, as a shock, but, uh, but you know, the ideal situation is that we get you know, uh, close to epsilon um, on, the, on the test data set. So if you measure it on the training data set, actually that measurement is not, uh, is not relevant at all for us. So we need to measure it on some unseen data that we call test data. And uh, when we get a value close to epsilon, um, it means that our estimated model is you know, close enough to the data generation process. Another way that we can think of this function being a good fit is that you know, when we have access to this data generation process, we can just simulate new data from it. You know? And let's say we just simulate these new data points from f, and they end up somewhere around f, right, with some noise. Again, the, the differences between these circles and the f curve is going to be some epsilon, right? And now, if we measure uh, you know, the closeness of these circles to f, that's pretty much the same thing as the closeness of these circles to f second. So that's you know, another reason why this is a good fit. Um, all right, so now let me um, take it to the other extreme. Um, so let me bring back the training data. So the training data were just some x's, right? Let's say these were the training data that we had. Um, what if I fit a function that goes like this? A function that meets all these points exactly. It kind of goes out of its way to fit all of these. Let's call it f tiers. So what about this one? I guess this one should be pretty easy. Underfit, good fit, or overfit? Overfit, because there's only one option left, right? So this has to be overfit. So why is this overfit? So this is overfit because um, in terms of fitting the training data, it's actually doing a marvelous job. It's you know, fitting, it's kind of matching every single one of them. But that's not the point of machine learning. Because with this function, if we now generate some new test data, so you know, some of these circles, now these circles, which come from f with some irreducible error epsilon, are going to be very far from, from f tiers. Right? These vertical lines show you the, um, the MSE of f tiers on some test data. So it, they are test data because they are circles, right? We didn't use them. We didn't use those circles for finding f tiers. So this one, if we measure some MSE for it, um, let's say MSE of TE for tests, this value is going to be much, much larger than epsilon. For, for F uh, second, this is going to be close to epsilon. Um, and actually, for this one, um, again, on a test data, it's going to be larger than epsilon. So you can see that all of these MSEs are based on test data, because measuring MSE on training data doesn't really tell us anything. Uh, because you know, we have used that data to, to find and estimate the parameters of the model. So it's like uh, you know, evaluating some model on, you know, um, on some answers that it has seen before. So it can just copy those answers without any, any inference. So that's pretty much the uh, you know, concept of underfit and overfit. So in machine learning, what we want to have uh, is models that um, correctly capture the nuances in the data generation process without fitting you know, too hard on every single data point. So this is a concept that, you know, that we're going to see again and again in this course. Um, so we can also think of this concept from the perspective of bias variance trade-off. So in terms of bias variance trade-off, this MSE value that you see has essentially um, three components. And we're going to see this later. Uh, so MSE essentially has three components in it. Uh, one is one is variance. The other one is bias. Yeah. So, uh, so again, we have to continue our tests. There is something that we did and we are missing. Before, we can have more support with the object. No, actually, when we fit a model, we measure this. We measure this, 
And based on the value we get, uh, we will decide whether it's a good fit or not. But essentially, there are three possibilities. It, can be, it may, might have fitted too hard to the data, or too loose to the data, or just right. So we're going to see later in the course, uh, actually in chapter five, when we talk about resampling and using a validation set. So you know, the data that we have is split it three ways, training data, validation data, and test data. And we use the training data to fit the model and estimate its parameter. For example, if it is just a line, estimating its intercept and slope. And then we use the validation set to compare the predictions of the model on those data points and the actual target value. And based on that evaluation, it will be one of these three cases. And in the case that it is underfit, we make some changes to the model, hoping that it becomes a good fit. In the case that it's overfit, again, we go back, make some changes to the training process, hoping that it becomes a good fit. So it's kind of an iterative process. Usually, we try our, you know, the very first model that we can come up with. We evaluate it using a validation set. If it is good enough, we continue and using it you know, for making predictions. But typically, the very first idea that we try is not going to be a good one. It's going to be underfit or overfit, especially if it is a flexible model and the data generation process is noisy. It's going to be one of these possibilities. That's why we need to go back to the training part and you know, make some different assumptions to hopefully get a good fit. All right, so talking about bias variance trade-off, essentially, MSE is variance plus bias squared plus irreducible error epsilon. So that's why um, I told you earlier that the you know, best thing we can do in terms of MSE is having a function um, whose MSE becomes equal to epsilon. Because when we have that, it means our function has a variance of zero and a bias of zero, which is just ideal. We cannot do any better than that. But uh, typically, these two parts um, are kind of misaligned. So when we increase the flexibility of a model, for example, instead of a line, instead of a you know, degree one polynomial, if we use a degree two polynomial, variance typically increases. Um, so when we want to make the model more flexible, to reduce the bias, the reduction in bias comes at the cost of increasing the variance. And the other way around, when we have a model uh, whose variance is high and we want to reduce the variance, we reduce the complexity or flexibility of the model, so this one comes down, this one goes up. That's the concept of bias variance trade-off. So when we look at MSE of a function, of, of a model, um, the MSE may look something like this, usually some U-shaped function. And this is the level of, the level of flexibility and you know, we have the option to choose a model here, maybe a degree one polynomial. Choose a, op choose a model here, a degree two polynomial. Choose a model here, a degree three polynomial. Or choose a model here, a degree nine polynomial. Right? And between these choices, the choice that gives us a bias variance trade-off is the ideal choice. That would be here. This is the level of flexibility in the model that matches with the nuances that we have in the data generation process. So, so thinking about this, um, this data generation process, F again, it has some level of complexity because it goes up and it comes down and it goes up again. And what we need for estimating this should also have the same level of complexity. It shouldn't be more complex and it shouldn't be less complex. So a function like this, you can see that it changes, the, the slope changes sign one time, two times, right? So as it changes sign, you know, we can see that a polynomial of degree three would be a suitable match for this. So just to give you some recap from, from mathematics, when we have a function that changes sign, the slope changes sign one time, a polynomial of degree two is good for this. Something like, something like this. When we have a function that never changes sign, it's, it's just you know, monotonically increasing, a polynomial of degree one is good for this. And when we have a function that changes sign two times, something like this, a polynomial of degree three is good for it. So something like a times x to the power of three plus b times x plus c. There can be also some bx here. So um, that's, that's the same situation. So essentially, we can have epsilon here, which is the irreducible error. And ideally, we want to decrease MSE of the test data set as much as it gets close to epsilon. So this is the ideal level of flexibility. So um, you may remember that first I do a line, and I told you that it's underfit. The case of a line is you know, somewhere here, where the level of flexibility of a line is not sufficient for capturing the nuances of this, for capturing the fact that this goes up and down and up again, because a line is going to only have one direction. It's not going to change, change slope. So the other situation was when, when I had a very weakly sort of function, something that was kind of uh, you know, going out of its way to fit with everything. There was something like this. I think we called it, uh, we called it F tiers. So, F tiers was 
was somewhere here. Because you know we have eight data points, and when you have eight data points, uh, you can always fit a polynomial of degree seven to them so that they fit precisely. This is because when you have like two points in the space, with two points, you can always draw a polynomial of degree one, and it fits perfectly, right? With three points, you can always fit a polynomial of degree two, and it fits perfectly, meaning that the MSE of the training data becomes zero. So this weekly function came from the fact that we had eight training data points, and we just let the model be as flexible as possible. We allowed it to have some coefficient for x to the power of seven, some coefficient for x to the power of six, some coefficient for x to the power of five. So that's a lot of flexibility that we're giving to the model. And when we fit such a flexible model on such a tiny data set, it's going to pick values so that it meets all of those training data points, such that it minimizes the training error to zero. But that situation will be here, somewhere where we have passed the bias, bias variance trade-off. So this one was f prime. This one was f second, sorry, f tiers. And here, this is f second. So that's the same concept. This one is underfit, this one is overfit, and this is a good fit. So a good fit is the same thing as achieving bias variance trade-off. Achieving a model that reduces this by reducing both variance and bias. So here, for f prime, um, the variance is low, uh, but the bias is high. For this one, the variance is high, but bias is low. And for this one, both of them are you know, kept to a certain value uh, so that we get as close as possible to the irreducible error. Does this make sense? Yeah? Uh, so essentially, this is the only thing that we're going to measure, MSE. So when we actually do the coding, you're going to measure MSE, which is the average of squares of errors between predictions of the model and the actual targets. So let me give you an example. So in the practical setting, what you see is, is only going to be MSE. So we're going to have some data set like this. Let's say we have 10 data points. We have some value for x, some value for y. This is our first data point. Let's say there are 10 of them. What we're going to do is using this part of the data for training, let's say this part of the data for, for validation, and some last part of the data for testing. So what does training mean here? So training, in terms of finding a regression, estimating a regression function, training means finding beta 0 and beta 1 for some function, let's say f hat of x, which is beta 0 plus beta 1 x. So this is a linear regression model, and we're estimating its parameters, because a linear function it always has some intercept and a slope. And we can use the training data, which are these data points, to estimate the value of beta 0 and the value of beta 1. So when I put the hat on top of a variable, it means that variable is being estimated. So we estimate this. When, we, when, we, when we're done with the estimation part, this function is going to be known to us. For example, it can be, let's say, 10 plus 5x. When we have the values of beta 0 and beta 1, Not that bad. All right, when we have the values of beta 0 and beta 1, we essentially have a function. And whenever we plug a number for x here, it's going to give us an estimate. So this is a function that always gives us some y hat values, some estimated images, essentially. So back to your question. Sorry, this is now a very long response. So when we have y hat values, MSE is going to be the average, the average of yi minus y hat i over i, and we, uh, we just square this. So this is going to give us MSE. This is the practical part. You only get some value called mean squared error. Why is it mean? Because it should be the average of these data points. So if we have a 1,000 of them, we're still interested in the error, not the error times 1,000. That's why we're averaging. So we're, for each data point, we look at the prediction, and we, we look at the actual value, take their difference. Their difference could be positive or negative. In order to get rid of the sign, we square them so that they don't cancel out with each other, and we average them. That gives us the MSE. And ideally, we make, you know, so this is, let's say, done on validation data. On the validation part of the data set, we measure MSE. 
and it will be some value, right? So let's say, you know, the very first time that I try a model, I call it model A, and it's going to have some MSE validation, let's say equal to 8.4. I have no idea what is the irreducible error because I don't know how noisy the data generation process is. If I knew epsilon, I could, I could possibly stop right here saying, all right, this is close to epsilon because epsilon is eight, so this is a good fit. But we don't even know what epsilon is, meaning that this horizontal line is unknown to us. What we know is just a point in space, and, and the only thing we can do is continue finding other points so that we kind of trace out this U-shaped curve and ideally find the minimum of that curve. Where we are at the minimum, we say the, the, good, the fitness of the model is suitable, and that's how we you know, decide on the model. So after measuring this, uh, maybe let's say A is a, maybe a is a uh, linear regression function. Then I'm going to try a different model, a uh, regression function of degree two. I estimate these parameters, and then I use the estimated model for making predictions. That's going to give us some new y hats. From the differences between actual values of y and those y hats, I get some MSE, and the MSE for validation set using model B is now, let's say, 7.4. What this means is that so far, the information we have is that there was some 8.4 here when we used model A. And now we have a new data point, 7.4, when we use model B, right? So what do you think that U-shaped curve is? I guess it could, be, it could be possibly something like this, or it could be a U-shaped curve whose minimum is already here and is going to go up after this. So we need to continue. With, with two points, we still don't know what's happening. So we use a third model. The third model can be whatever. It can be a random forest. Because this was a linear regression, very simplistic, very um, basic, you know, not that much capable of capturing nuances in the data. This is more complex. So the next model we can try should be ideally more flexible and more complex. So here the x-axis represents flexibility or complexity of a model. And a random forest is much more flexible than a regression of degree two. Let's say we use a random forest for us, random forest is just a model right now. Later in the course, we're going to see how it works. And we measure MSE, and it goes up again. It becomes 9.4. So when that happens, now we, we get a sense of this U-shaped curve being something like this. So from this evaluation, we decide to use model B instead of A or C, because it is the model that minimizes MSE for us. And we did all of these using training data for fitting the models and validation for validating the models or evaluating the models, but the test set is still unused. And that's great, because we want the test set to be unused until we decide on the model. Now we have decided that model we're going to use is B, so you know, if we have a client, you know, and we want to report the model that we have for their data, then we use it on the test set, that's going to give us some other MSE, it's going to MSE of test set for model B, and some other value, and that's what we report to the client, for example. That would be, and you know, um, an, e an evaluation that has nothing to do with the, with the design of the model, because we came up with the design before even touching the test set, and that should, that should be the case. Um, any questions? Yeah? So, so complexity and flexibility are kind of the same thing. So here, the x-axis is both flexibility and complexity. A more, complica a more complex model is also more flexible in terms of fitting to the data, you know, because, because a polynomial of degree three can take any of these forms. It can, it, can afford, it can take a form like this, it can take a form like this, uh, it can also take a form like this without any changes of sign. So it's more flexible, you know, you just, you just uh, fit it to the data and it captures the patterns that are in the data. If the data looks like this, it, it, the model becomes like this. If the data is more wiggly, the function becomes like this. So it's more flexible compared to a linear regression, which is just a line. So it, it may take this form or this form. That's, that's the only possibilities. Yes? Variance versus flexibility. Yeah. So variance versus flexibility. Uh, maybe I can draw it somewhere else. Variance versus flexibility is usually something like Typically something like this, uh, but it depends on the data generation process um, and, and the sort of model that we have. So typically, with increasing flexibility, variance increases. But we're going to see some cases, for example, tree-based models, uh, which are pretty flexible, and, and their variance doesn't increase that much. For example, uh, bagging, 
um, which means boost, boost, bootstrap aggregation on trees, uh, are methods that allow us to reduce the bias without actually increasing the variance. And they work on a very simple idea that when you average something or aggregate something, the variance of average of a sample is the variance of the sample divided by n. And because of that, these, uh, the idea of bagging decision trees allows us to increase flexibility without increasing variance. But typically, the pattern looks like this. And for, and for bias and flexibility, uh, typically the pattern is kind of decreasing. So this one increases, this one decreases. That's why their addition becomes usually some U-shaped function. And a U-shaped function has some minimum, and that's bias variance trade-off. Does this answer your question now? Thanks. Other questions? No? All right. Maybe we can now take a break. Um, and uh, we'll be back in 10 minutes for the rest of the lecture. <laughs>